All right, folks, today I want to address a frequently asked question. Can HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts, be useful for modern self-defense? And my instructor Eric and I actually recorded this on the same day as we did the video on the thumb grip, so it's got the same messed up audio, which is why I'm not going to use all of it. But either way, so let's get into it. Now, it's of course quite a topic, and you could discuss this for many hours, basically. It depends on you know what kind of situation, what self-defense situation, which historical martial art you practice in particular, what you have available, and so on and so forth. There's so many factors and variables. But you know, just a few pointers and thoughts here and there. So I'm going to focus mainly on armed uh, historical martial arts. Of course, there are plenty of unarmed martial arts as well. You have pugilism, for example, which obviously is useful uh, for unarmed self-defense. And uh, there is various forms of wrestling, for example, you know, be it Greek or the Nordic version, Glima, which of course is also used a lot in sword fighting. And uh, there's a variety of other things that are very much applicable. Bartitsu, for example, which is a martial arts system that was developed around the turn of the last century. Obviously, that could be used. It includes techniques with uh, walking sticks, canes. Then there's, of course, also dagger techniques in the various manuals. Now, in the medieval and renaissance manuals, this is a different kind of beast. You know, if you were to compare something like this to a modern folding knife, for example, yeah, that's, that's not really very similar, and these techniques wouldn't carry over too well, because in this case, most of the techniques are dagger versus dagger. Both of them have one. The chances that you run into somebody who attacks you with a knife and then you draw your own knife and it turns into a knife fight, the chances are very low of that happening nowadays. Whereas in historical times, carrying a dagger like this was a lot more common. So that might have happened. And um, some of those techniques could still be applicable because you know, it's, it's a lot of grappling, of course. There are plenty of joint locks and throws, takedowns, you're controlling the arm in various ways, but there are also a lot of techniques that you simply couldn't do with anything but this. For example, there are some that involve uh, having the, the blade behind your opponent's neck like this. So let's say you aim for the neck, you miss, and now the blade is behind their neck, and now you reach and grab and control this way. That's not exactly something you can do with a modern folding knife, for example. And when it comes to knife defense, I feel like it's important to point out that, you know, whenever I discuss things like this in a video, this is not meant as an instructional. This is not meant for anybody to just you know, watch a video and then get out and be like, oh yeah, I now know how to defend myself against the knife. No, please don't. Uh, I'm just gonna let Eric say it in his words. This is the ultimate knife defense technique. Put your hands up like this, and then... Of course, any kind of self-defense situation can be very dangerous. If there is a blade involved, it gets exponentially more dangerous, and you don't really want to mess with that. If you can't help it, you don't even want to be there. And the problem with a lot of these techniques is, I mean, there are lots of discussions and actually angry debates in the martial arts community nowadays of self-defense against knives. Some say there's no way you can defend yourself against the knife unarmed, and they've got a point. Others say, well, there are certain techniques that can work, and etc. There's a lot of disagreement, understandably so, because this is the kind of thing that is hard to really prepare for. Um, okay, I don't want to sidetrack this too much into knife defense, but let's just think about how, what you could do if you learned HEMA and you're confronted by someone and, and you're dragged into a, a self-defense situation. So the basics, of course, carry over. Footwork, for example. In HEMA, just like in any unarmed martial art, you learn how to move efficiently, without tripping over your own legs and without losing balance, things like that, you know, uh, advancing and retreating steps, passing steps, gathering steps, various ways of using your, your footwork to power your attacks um, or, or defense as well. And uh, again, 
grappling is definitely essential in a lot of historical martial arts. A rapper up here, tuck him in, and somebody over my left shoulder is going to say, Hey Eric, what? Although this particular technique is intended for use against the blade attack, again, the basics apply. You, know, you control someone's limb, you break their structure, or you pull them over your leg, you, you know, rotate your core to generate a lot more power than they can and do with just their arm trying to resist that. Things like that. Controlling distance, for example, is important. With swords, for example, you generally start at a distance where you can't hit each other and then you have to take a passing step to execute a cut or thrust or anything else like that. And then you have to constantly be aware of controlling that distance. You know, being aware of, okay, if the opponent steps in now, now they're in a position where they can threaten you. And, um, you know, do you want to stay there? Do you want to disengage? Things like that. And that off also, of course, applies to uh, fighting unarmed. This is the kind of thing that you also often see in uh, footage from security cameras, for example, if they pick up a street fight, you know, you often see this, this big haymaker that is very telegraphed and easy to see, and uh, then the defender just takes a step back to, to let that pass, and then they move forward and, you know, retaliate. So uh, this is the same kind of principle that you use, you know, distance, timing, and, um, yeah, body structure, overall so if you know how to throw a, a good sword cut that in and of itself doesn't mean you know how to throw a good punch but you at least you have a solid foundation if you know how to throw a good sword cut you know that you know to make it as efficient as you can and generate a maximum amount of force you don't just stand here and, and throw just with your arm i mean there are there is a place for that there there are wrist cuts of course, that, that you can use. But you know, if you want to do a very powerful cut, you rotate your entire body into it, and you, you essentially drive the cut with your legs and uh, make it much harder that way. And that, of course, also applies. If you know that, if you know that the cut basically comes from your core and from your legs and not just your arm, then you can also figure out, okay, I shouldn't throw a punch like this because that's not going to do much. But if I drive with my legs, then I can generate a lot more force that way. Now, the form, of course, is not going to be as good as if you've actually practiced punches in an unarmed martial art. Being able to transfer a lot of force, of course, doesn't mean that you do the punch well. You can still leave yourself wide open. And if you step into it and you throw this big, powerful punch and you just hang out there, then yeah, you'll be in trouble because you're extremely exposed. Which, again, you can kind of figure out based on your experience with HEMA. If you just, you know, throw this big cotton and you just kind of stand there like, ha, huh, uh, what now, then yes, you will probably receive a counter thrust in the face or something like that. So again, the general mindset definitely carries over. It's not the same as actually practicing that martial art, especially considering that the dynamics are very much different. In a street fight, somebody might just rush you and try to take you down. Not quite as likely in HEMA. Sure, some people will very much want to seek close distance if they are strong and very good at grappling, then yeah, it's very much in their interest to try to charge in, but they still have to get past your weapon, right? It's still different. Um, so the other thing is, with regards to reach, if somebody threatens you with a knife and you have a walking stick or a cane or anything like that, then yes, you very much have the reach advantage. So in that case, you could try to target the hand and to strike it, depending on whether you want to prioritize speed or power, you can either hold it like this, you know, in case of the walking stick like this, it's tapered and it's got the additional weight here. So if you were to grab it here, this would allow for much faster strikes. If you grip it the other way around, this is going to be more powerful. So depending on what you want to do, so you could as I said, strike the hand and try to make them drop the knife and then either get away or follow up. You have to keep in mind, not everybody reacts the same. You know, some people, if you, if you strike them in the arm, they will flinch, they will drop things, they will you know, feel the pain and be affected by it. Other people, 
they will just rush at you like a pissed off buffalo and they don't care and if they get struck here even if you break the arm they may still keep coming at you and tackle you and, and bring you down and, and keep stabbing you things like that so again there's a lot of different aspects involved and if you really want to know how to defend yourself in a you know modern or say nowadays self-defense scenario and you should practice that HEMA is not going to prepare you as well for that but of course if you want you can during your HEMA practice go through scenarios that could happen in everyday life so let's say you have this cane and you walk around and somebody just suddenly rushes at you and then you figure out okay what do I do do I push them back and then strike then you can go through different scenarios of course sparring that's really a very important thing here. When we're talking about martial arts, we're talking about martial art where you actively spar. When I was growing up, I did a lot of various Asian martial arts, and I always made fun of Taekwondo because it was a sport. But there's one important thing that pretty much every Taekwondo school does is they spar a lot. That, in and of itself, is very practical. Yes, the, the movements and things that they're practicing in class are mainly sportive in nature, but because they're sparring, they are growing accustomed to the way they can move, how their opponent can move, and the intensity of a simulated fight. This is much more valuable than the pure self-defense, you know, my techniques are too deadly to spar type of martial arts, where they never spar, and Typically, you see that kind of person fall apart in a real situation. Efficient striking is, of course, helpful. Chances are you're not going to walk around with a sharp sword or a machete in the city, right? A walking stick you may have. And uh, in that case, with a blunt object, it's important to generate as much force as you can because the sheer impact is really what drives this it doesn't have an edge or a point to concentrate the energy so you have to deliver as much force as you can so being able to do that biomechanically efficiently of course helps so just doing these little arm taps wouldn't be terribly effective compared to you know turning into it and you know striking from the hip you can generate much more power that way and this is of course what you learn in HEMA at least if you have a good instructor. Quarter staff techniques used to be much more applicable in medieval times where it was pretty common to just walk around with a quarter staff as a walking stick and for you know knocking fruit down trees and various things. Um, I think people would probably look at you a little funny if you walked around with one of these. I mean it's not like it's illegal or anything like you can very much do that it would just seem a little odd and out of place uh, if you had something like this like like a really sturdy staff then yeah that can be quite effective depends on how much space you have though and the other really important thing that one should point out is in most situations it's not going to be a confrontation like in the movies or in a, in a duel where somebody just you know stands in front of you and you know, assumes a fighting pose or draws their weapon and clearly signals to you that they are about to attack you and you have to defend yourself chances are in a modern self-defense situation they might jump you ambush you pretty much and might you know work in groups you know somebody to distract you somebody else to walk up to you from behind knock you over the head with something or you know suddenly stab you from an angle that you didn't see coming that's the real danger quite often so this is a lot about increasing your situational awareness and generally being strategic about where you walk and how and how you keep track of your surroundings and how you negotiate try to de-escalate things like that so th these are all things that you're taught in modern self-defense so yeah basically when somebody asks is HEMA useful for self-defense nowadays the short answer is it depends the long answer is it depends <laughs> seriously though the short answer is it's better than nothing it will help to an extent it will give you some foundations that you can work off of but of course it's better to practice a dedicated unarmed self-defense system that is you know, 
intended for use on the street nowadays. I bet you didn't really need me to figure that out, but hopefully you still found the video interesting. Thanks for watching. Have a good one, folks, and stay safe. Thank <laughs> you.